And uh, welcome to uh, online testing techniques. And uh, I, I like how everyone has grabbed the back tables there. I may just come down on the floor uh, before we're done here. Um, so I just want to say thanks for inviting me here to speak here this week. It's been a lot of fun already. Uh, I used to attend the, the SIPA December uh, Miami meetings. And so now seeing this, uh, just this group and the excitement that's part of it is just a, a fantastic, uh, I don't know, it, it's just cool to see everyone working together and, and the results of that. Uh, in presenting online testing techniques, just a little bit about my background. I've been doing online marketing now for about 20 years. Uh, when I got out of the Army, I had a degree. I didn't really know what to do with it. And then all of a sudden, the internet came along. And uh, I just immediately jumped into that and started building websites. Got my first start in search engine optimization. Uh, in the late 90s when all you had to do was stuff keywords into a website and you could get rankings. And my, how it's evolved since then. Uh, but since then, uh, I've developed a, a consulting agency, which I have since uh, sold off, and now do training and consulting for companies, helping them to improve their profitability for their online marketing. So in talking about online testing, the first thing that I want to communicate that if you want to start a system, if you want to start online testing, it will start with your culture. I was just talking to Ron this morning about a good friend of mine that works at a, a large company, and he started doing some A-B testing. In fact, he started with the home page, and he started with a call to action on the home page. The test ran for three weeks, and in those three weeks, the test alone created $2 million of incremental value that would not have been created had he not run the test. When he presents this at the next meeting, his immediate supervisor asks him, who authorized you to do this test? It all comes down to your culture. Do you have a culture that is conducive for people being creative and saying, I think this will work. I think there's a problem here. If you allow a culture of questioning, a culture of challenging, can I say your testing and your analytics people should be the most subversive people in your organization? Because they should be the ones that don't accept the status quo. They don't accept the website or the marketing as is. They feel like it can always be improved. And so unless you have a culture that welcomes ideas, that welcomes improvement, that welcomes allowing anyone to have a voice as to what they think may be tested, then really saying we're going to start testing when you don't allow dissension is you're not creating that culture. You're not allowing that voice to be heard. And so really what it comes down to is if you're going to start a testing plan, what is your plan? What do you want out of testing? It can be as simple as just trying a few small things, maybe a small A-B test. It can be as big as bringing in a third party firm to test the usability and easeability of getting through your site. It, there, it, it spans the spectrum but in reality, the, the best tests are usually the simplest and easiest. But what are you going to do with the results? Are you going to implement them? How soon can you implement them? What kind of a system do you have that will allow those types of changes? How soon can it be done? What is your plan to handle results of testing? And so unless you have a specified group of people that are in charge of doing this and implementing this and, and having the meeting of what did we learn from this, again, you're not creating a culture that will accept testing. And so we've got to build processes. What are we going to test? What do we expect to find at the conclusion of this test? And how will we handle the results? When the test is completed, do the results line up with the expected results? If so, how will you handle that? Who's going to handle that? Build the plan to handle the testing. Now, the very first test is the easiest test, and this is the one that we challenge people to do because anyone can do this. We call it the mom test. Now, I had to change my picture of moms because I was accused of ageism. 
because I had a picture of an older woman on here and I was rebuked by an older woman who said, just because I have white hair doesn't mean I don't know how to use a website. So I went for a younger mom. The mom test is based on my mom. Because when I started building websites in the mid 90s, I had to test them somehow. And I figured if my mom could use them, anyone could use them. And so the purpose of the mom test is simply write down a series of tasks that need to be accomplished on the website by your users. Simple tasks, Register, fill out a registration, download a white paper, anything that there is a specific search and discovery process. Create those tasks, hand them off to somebody, and then sit back and watch. Don't guide, don't interrupt, just watch. In fact, the value is in observing, listening to the words that they say. There are many services online that you can pay someone and you can watch them through your camera on the computer. It's, it's like a Skype session and they will try and perform these tasks and they will record their screen where their mouse goes and you can also see their face. Like I said, you can start simple and just gas an intern to try and accomplish a certain task. Or you can go big and hire a firm to do multiple tests and like this. But really the core of it is just asking a third party who doesn't really know much about the site, isn't familiar with it, and ask them, can you accomplish these tasks? You see, the problem with us is we see our websites every day. To us, our websites get old and dingy very quickly. We forgive a lot of the problems. We know the nuances of our website, just like we know that there's a squeaky board in our house. We just accept it and move on. Having a third party look at our site and accomplish an objective and then tell us what was easy or difficult about that. That is the easiest and probably the highest return activity you will ever get of any online testing activity. The next is simply talking to your customers. What is it about your customers that they like about you and doing business with you? How many of you have ever done a net promoter score activity for your business? Okay, we've got a few. I found doing this type of questionnaire was one of the most invaluable things we ever did to test our message and to test that our website was delivering the right message to our customers. The Net Promoter Score is based off a question, how likely are you to recommend our company or services or product to others? And if you answer nine or 10 on one of those surveys, you are a promoter. If you answer a seven or an eight, it means that you like that company, but you're being nice. It means you'll be seen with them, but you don't wanna be seen holding hands, to put it another way. And then anyone who was a six or below, and, and it's weighted towards people just being nice. Six or below is a detractor. Now in this type of a survey, you might also wanna grab some quotes and some feedback to, from people and then group that feedback according to their score. And what we saw here is that our promoters were saying, it's worth it, it's worth it. Our passives, those are the ones that were the sevens and eights, too expensive. It works, but too expensive. And then our detractors, we used it, didn't see any results, too expensive. What was interesting here is we found out that everyone thought the product was expensive, but our promoters, found that it was invaluable. And so we looked at the language that each group used and then measured that according to our findings and according to our marketing. And what we found, obviously, is that price is the number one objection. And this is invaluable, especially from a sales standpoint, to know your customer's number one objection before you even talk to them. As a salesperson, when you know the objection, what can you do? You prepare for it. You know how to overcome it. You know how to turn a negative into a positive. And so what this enables us to do is know the objection immediately going in. And what we found is that performance always overcomes price. When you can show a greater return than the investment and a growth of return, it overcomes the price objection. 
So how did we do that? Well, a couple of things that we did is number one, free trial. You know, that's one of the, the no-brainers that you can do. But also what we found is that the passives and the detractors, in some of their comments, we realized that they weren't using the product to its full capability. They weren't using all the features. They weren't getting involved with it. And so what we developed was an onboard process for new customers. That onboard process included a six-week workbook that walked people through what to look for and when to look for it. So on week one, day three, look for this, you should see this. Week one, day five, you should see this. Week two, day two, look for these things and write them down. And the only way you could get your money back is if you turned in a completed workbook. Well, what that onboard process did is it educated people as to the value of the product. And then also what we did was instituted a quarterly contest. So people that went through, filled out the workbook, saw the results, they were put into a quarterly contest and we initiated winners based on that. The second thing that we found is that the wording on the website did not match the benefits that were given to us by the loyalists. Our benefits that we were pitching on the website we thought were fantastic well-researched, well-documented. However, the benefits to our loyalists were very different. And so immediately we had a communication problem. We're saying it's good for these reasons, but our loyalists see it's good for these reasons. So immediately we need to refigure some of our content because the content was mainly scientific-based, studies, tests, here's all the information. What they were responding to were human interest, case studies, focus pieces on different customers. They were more interested in the human aspect. And so we needed to change the content, change the testimonials to better match the customer perceived benefits. The third thing is, is we found out that our loyalists breed more loyalists. Loyalists were built from word of mouth from other loyalists. And so our best customers came from our best customers. Our worst customers came from magazine advertising, pay-per-click marketing, some of our most expensive channels created some of our least satisfied customers. And so what we needed to do was change our approach and reward our promoters, give them a simpler message to take and spread via word of mouth. This is what I call our most successful social media campaign ever because we didn't make a tweet, we didn't make a Facebook post, we didn't do anything. Instead, we sent a big box of goodies to our loyalists. Hats, mugs, shirts, all kinds of stuff that they would put in their offices, that they would put out for people to see and enable them to talk to their friends about the product they were using. So from an architectural standpoint, what this told us is we needed to change our benefits messaging. And so when we looked at the website, we found that we were focused, the architecture, the words, the navigation, were all focused around more of a scientific aspect rather than an education emphasis. We were trying to educate people scientifically rather than educate them as far as in real words that they were using. They didn't want all the jargon. And so we went more towards performance. How does this work? How will this benefit you? Here's how it worked for other people. And then also from the content, we wanted to make things more short uh, or shorter, more bite-sized, more memorable, so that it would be, make it easier for them to communicate to other people. In the content marketing, uh, more wanted to express the concerns expressed by customers, less technical, more human interest, and then reward our loyalists. By doing that kind of activity, that net promoter score enabled us to better perceive how our customers saw us, and how our customers saw the company and the product, and how we could change in order to better match their perceived benefits. So this is more of a high level, more ethereal type of testing, but to get in the mind of the customer, it helps you make better decisions because you're no longer looking at the website in your opinion, based on your constant meddling with the website. You're seeing your marketing and your website through the customer's eyes, through how they see you, and it forces you to think in their terms. 
And that's the critical thing about testing, is thinking about the site in the customer's terms. The top five quests, if you're doing questionnaires in order to do any testing, the main thing we're testing on that is to make sure that our benefits are aligned with the customer, that we're on the same purpose, that we're matching language. And so any type of questionnaire where we're asking for feedback, we are always looking at the words that people use to describe the business. Uh, we're also making sure that we're solving the right problems. Make sure you understand the critical problems that customers have when they come to your site. What are they looking for and what will solve those? And then from a sales perspective, what is your primary objection? What's the primary objection to buying your product? The next thing is email, and I have found email lately to be one of the most fun things to deal with. Email has grown drastically in terms of effectiveness, in terms of new customer acquisition, as well as in loyalty marketing. Uh, the ability now to focus email messaging on small segments of your audience. Email can become more personal, relevant, and timely the more you learn about your customers, the more you can communicate with them. The number one thing you can work on to improve an email is your subject line. This is what gets the open, the subject line to grab someone's attention. And the number one thing you can do is leave out unnecessary words. Yesterday in the social media boot camp, I was having people write their value statement in five words or less. And the key to doing that is to eliminate the word and. Stop using the word and. I can't tell you how many subject lines we see that go right off the page because people can't stop writing. They always want to add more and more benefit and so you see and, and, and. Stop using the word and in your subject lines and you immediately see them become much more focused, much tighter, and better suited towards the customer. So leave out the word and because it immediately creates a completely separate thought. It, it, it distracts you from the primary purpose. It adds more words and it will just dilute the goal. The, the goal for creating a good subject line is to tell people what's inside, but don't sell it. Tell them what they're gonna see, but let your copy in the email do the selling. Or let the copy in the email keep moving people to the landing page where you're going to do the selling. The subject line is just the bait to get them in. And so when we analyze subject lines and how they're used, direct messages make up the vast majority of the types of subject lines. Uh, but anything that is more fun or curious have higher open rates. Uh, so I find that to be a little odd that people like direct messages. They want to know what's in there. Uh, but anything that's fun or curious has a higher open rate, of course you're creating some sense of curiosity. People want to see what's in there. But of course, subject line isn't it. Kind of a rule of thumb is to keep it about 50 characters or less, but obviously that is not a rule. Feel free to break that at any time because there are no rules when it comes to subject lines. What we find is that subject lines, the length, are People react differently to the length of subject lines based on the industry, based on basically a lot of things. So business products and services, on average, have a 20% unique open rate when there are more than 76 characters in the subject line. This is why I say go ahead and break the rule because it's completely based on your industry, who you are, and what your customers expect but feel free to break that rule. As you can see, uh, travel, uh, conversely, has a higher open rate when there are less than 26 characters. And so based on what type of industry you are, you may see people reacting a little bit differently, depending upon the type of information that you are sharing. Uh, MailChimp uh, published uh, results of their best open rates and their worst open rates. The funny thing is, and I don't know if you can read it, I can't from here, um, but their best open rates were open rates, were uh, subject lines such as sales and marketing newsletter. Isn't that sexy? May 2005 news bulletin. 
uh, January, February newsletter, uh, website news. Uh, let me see. We're throwing a party. That was one of their best. Some of their least were the fun and curiosity, such as last minute gift or Valentine's. Shop early and save 10%. Give a gift certificate this holiday. Valentine's Day salon and spa specials. Those had the least open rates. So it's, it's a very interesting mix depending upon you, your audience, and what they expect from you. So when you're testing emails, the number one thing that we test is the subject line. Because that, we have seen, gives us the best chance. The subject line is what contributes directly to the open. If we can get the open, then we can test the creative. Then we can test the frequency, time of day, time of week, whenever, those types of things. But everything seems to hinge on that subject line and getting that open. Because once they get open, then we can test everything else and del delve into those things. Just looking at, so, oh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you're going for a, a business office or a business uh, audience, definitely short and to the point. Uh, more of a home user, and this is where uh, tablets really kind of changed the market because people were no longer sitting at a desk leaning forward into their computers. They were sitting back on their couch looking at their tablet. They had more time to browse and think through things, so that does change, absolutely, yes. All right. Getting into all right, time of day uh, is an interesting thing to look at. The majority of emails are sent just after noon Eastern time, uh, and then go down from there. Obviously, you're trying to capture both the Eastern time and Western time audiences. And so, if you're looking at time of day to try and reach people depends maybe you can even break up your emails we've seen some companies do that where they will send to an east coast audience only and then they will send to their west coast audience and so they're segmenting their email messages based on region in order to get into the email box around nine in the morning on either coast and so it's a couple of different strategies you can do there uh, day of week obviously and some of you may even know this just by watching your inbox that uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, and, and even a I, I was surprised to see Friday so high that more emails are sent on Friday than on Monday. Uh, but again, based on your industry, uh, we did a couple of tests. Uh, one was for a, uh, a local landscaping company, and we found out that their best open and click rates were on Fridays and Saturdays. People getting ready for the weekend, get, making their plans for what they're going to do around their home. And so it changes based on who you're trying to reach and when you're trying to reach them. Uh, what's interesting is the majority of emails are sent on Tuesday. Uh, also, the highest open rate is on Tuesday and on Friday. Of course, that's only by one point. So we're only talking about generalities. And again, it may not be to your business. but it might be a good thing to measure for your business that if you send emails out on certain days, what are we looking at as far as open and click rates? What is it average for your business? However, if you don't get an open or a click within 24 hours, guess what? It's essentially dead. Uh, the most of what you are going to get is going to happen in that first hour, and then it will trail off from there. Uh, now, also, you cannot measure all your campaigns exactly the same way. When we start breaking down specific campaigns, realize that each campaign has a different message. And so by breaking down all of your campaigns to look and see what are they doing, you want to test apples to apples. So you want to test, right here we're testing a, a cart abandoned email. We've got two different tests going on, and we can see one is generating nearly a 3% response rate, the other end's generating a 2.3% response rate. So we're comparing apples to apples. We're not comparing our cart abandon 
to our reviews email because it's two completely different messages. It's based on a triggered response based on what someone just did. And so we've got different review emails, one and four are being tested here, and both are performing fairly well. We need a lot more data with that. Uh, but then you can go into our thank yous. We've got three different thank you emails running here, and one's running at about a 0.77% response rate compared to the others. So within your email campaigns, compare your like campaigns to get a sense of which messages are being responded to better. And so you can even test from there. Now when a survey of asking marketers, what do you test when it comes to your email campaigns? 97% test their subject line first, 81% test their creative second. Uh, also, are probably around in the middle there, what you'll see is time of day and time of week are around in the middle there, uh, and then some other variables there. So this is what types of testing do you perform? The follow-up question is, of the tests you perform, which have the most impact? And as you can see, subject line and creative are two of the highest return on activities that you can do for your email campaigns, focusing on those areas. As you can see, time of day and day of week significantly declined because those are just external factors. The primary factors are what you're putting in front of people at that moment. That's the primary factor. So when you send out an email, there's always a questionnaire that we ask people to go through, and that is, are you tracking analytics on your email? If you're sending emails without tracking analytics, then you're not testing, you're not measuring, you do not have a culture of testing. And so making sure that you're testing those emails is the first and critical part to doing so. From lines, oh I could, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, however, I do see a lot of companies that are doing different things with from lines. The problem is, is when the from line is not immediately recognizable. Um, I had one company that I was on their list, and every email I got from them was from a different person in the organization. Now, when I don't know them by name, but I know the organization, it was just a little, there was a disconnect. And so you want to make sure that your from is recognizable, not different people in the organization every time there's a new email or a different subject or something like that. Uh, but that, that's really my only rule on, on the from line is just, do people know who they're getting it from? I wouldn't try anything fancy, but yeah. <laughs> Am I sending a specific message to a specific group? Are you sending uh, segmented emails to the right people? Do they have a specific message? to those people. If you're sending regionally, are you sending a regional message? If you're sending to a specific group of people based on content, is that reflected in the email? Is it conversational? Basically, I can sum all this up in three words. Is it relevant, is it personal, and is it timely? If it's not relevant, personal, and timely, don't send it. But if it is relevant to the customer, if it's timely based on information you know about them and what they need, and if it's personal, based on information you have about them, then yes, track it and send it. Okay, getting into architecture and what we can do with that. Testing your architecture is sort of like the mom test, but we're gonna go a little more structured. And so one way you can test your structure is what we call a card sort. And this is as simple as just getting a couple of post-it pads and a wall. And on the post-it pads, what you do is you write down the page of every page of your website based on content. You start at the top level and work down. And you just start breaking out all the content of your website and start organizing it. You just move around the sticky notes and put them and group them and classify them. This is called taxonomy. And we all do this. It's how we group and organize information. And so you can have different people in your organization group and classify information, and they may look at it completely differently than you. I find this happens a lot, you know, especially in wine. If we look at the way people group and classify wine, 
Some people know exactly what they're ordering when they order wine. They know the region, they know uh, what type of grape. There are others that order by color. Uh, there are some that order by price. It, it's all a matter of how we organize and group wine. We do the same thing with our web content. And so if we start looking at, for example, an auto uh, website, we put all of the content on these cards and then we just start organizing and grouping it. There are online versions of this that you can do and you can also send out invitations to people and ask them to do this type of a card sort. You can also do what's called an open card sort where you just, it's a free for all. Ask people to group the stuff any way they want. A closed card sort is where you set the main categories and then people organize under those categories. This is a great way of making sure that you are using the same vocabulary as your customers, that you are grouping and organizing information in the way that your customers perceive that it should be grouped and organized as well. So it's a great way of just making sure that as people organize information, they're doing it the same way you do, or that you want, may want to adjust your organization of information so that it's in a more logical place as identified by your customers. And the reports you get off the online versions of card sorts are really fantastic. They give you a good sense of where you match and where you're far apart in terms of making sure certain content is in different places. Now the next level of testing is called a tree test. A tree test is a glorified mom test. I come up with a specific task. This task here is for an administrator of an internal medicine clinic looking for information on financing the purchase. That is the task. The task then, then gives them the navigation options. And so based on the navigation, they have to click one in order to figure out, well, where would I go? And so they click on one option there, and then they see the sub-navigation. And they look through the sub-navigation in order to find where is this for me? And then they go and they continue to see the sub-navigation as they go down through the site. And again, this looks at how you organize, the words you use, and how you label things accordingly. And then when they get to the end of the task, they receive an option that says, this is where I'd find it. They click the button and then they move on to the next task. Well then what you get is a nice report that breaks down how directly did people go and find the answer to the task? How quickly did they do it? And was it accurate or not? A quick look at how this works is you will see, so for example, uh, this was a task of where would you go to subscribe to the weekly newsletter? 66% of testers had success in finding the right place. 53% uh, were able to go there directly the first time. So this means that almost half of the people that tested the navigation had to back up and find another direction in order to subscribe to the weekly newsletter. Uh, and then the average time taken to do that was 12 seconds. We can also see where they went in order to go look for how to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, and anything in blue is a backtrack. And so it gives us a sense of, well, where did they think they were going in order to subscribe? Maybe we actually do need to have a subscribe button. And so it helps you see how people will navigate just based on the navigational options, not the content of the page, but just the options presented to them in the navigation and how easily they can get through that. And so the top five tests you can do with tree testing or mom testing or any of this is number one, it has to be task-based. Never open up your website and ask someone, what do you think? That's not a test. That's just asking for someone's opinion on the design and the prettiness of that web page. You have to test with tasks. So tasks you're testing words to make sure you're organizing the same way, making sure that you have clarity in your directions and in the words that you're using. And then also you're testing for speed to make sure that for easy tasks, they can be accomplished very quickly. Now, pay-per-click. 
pay-per-click is one to me one of the most fun things second to email to jump in and work with simply because there's so many options that you can test that's also the problem there's so many options you can test one of the things that we look at is that click-through rate now granted I will say as a disclaimer we are looking at the conversion rate more than anything else however click-through rate is on the way to conversion rate and you can greatly reduce your pay-per-click spend with a higher quality score and the major part of the quality score is the click-through rate so the first thing to test on pay-per-click is new headlines and ad copy that is the fastest and easiest thing to test when it comes to to pay-per-click same as with email it's that subject line it's the headline it's the ad copy you can see here the difference it makes as soon as you get in there and you start testing new headlines you take your best performing one leave it there take your least performing ones change them and see how that reacts and so what you can also do in this is, gets into more strategic levels of testing is uh, we've got a, a, a software program that tracks rankings on search engines but not just we don't want to know that we're number one in Google that's irrelevant what we're looking at is how do we rank in different cities around the US for specific words and so we can do geo rankings because as you know rankings are going to be very different computer to computer person to person office to office region to region Google is focusing on giving a personalized experience and so what we do with this software is we look to see in target markets where do we rank for words in different cities we can break this down by zip code but also what this gives us an ability to do is to look and see for those rankings in different cities which of our competitors are buying paid ads specific to those regions and so we can do more regional pay-per-click marketing rather than just doing a broad national campaign we can focus it on places where we know we have an ideal target and we can see that in some of these cases here that our competitors are nowhere in doing regional based advertising and a regional based advertising and pay-per-click is a lot less per click than doing a national campaign because you can focus it on a specific region zip code or radius in a city and that lowers your pay-per-click rates and that can increase your click-through rates because it's targeted and then you can also give a more regional focused ad copy and so looking for opportunities in that way where you can make sure that people are your competitors may not even be there uh, for one campaign uh, just doing this focusing on some regional targets rather than a national campaign uh, immediately they saw that their conversion rate went up 111 percent by focusing on regional targets rather than just a national campaign and looking to see where regionally they could focus that campaign through doing that same activity uh, so also by looking at you know looking diving down from regional even into cities uh, just looking at a geo targeted campaign again they increase the same campaign another 80 percent by doing geo targeting looking specifically at people and then going down into day parting in different regions one of the things this was for a university and they were doing degree completion programs one of the things that we saw in the trends is that the click-throughs went down on Thursday non-existent on Friday non-existent on Saturday but then Sunday night and early Monday morning that's when the most amount of clicks came through well it didn't take much to realize these were people that hated their jobs they wanted to go back to school and get a degree finish the degree and get a better job so the entire campaign got front-loaded onto Mondays and Tuesdays because that was when the vast majority of leads were gathered from just doing that day parting that company saw another 57 percent improvement in their conversion rate then this is where testing gets fun 
And you have to have a culture that allows strange ideas. Because for this college, one of the ideas was, well, we have degrees in engineering, in software, in mathematics. These are all left brain degree programs. But we also have design, fashion, and all art, which are right brain. What if we gave left brain people a left justified landing page? And what if we gave right brain people a right justified landing page? How many of you would laugh that person out of your room right now? Be honest. That is a harebrained idea. However, they went ahead and tested it. And overall, there wasn't a, a huge general. But what I want you to see is that in HVAC and the MBA program, overall, there was a 44% rate conversion rate, or 44% improvement in conversion rate just by running the test. They improved the conversion rate. But HVAC and the MBA program, by giving them the left brain, left justified form, those conversion rates went up 88% and 90%. So for a few degrees, it really worked. In general, it lifted the conversion rate anyway, just by, just by doing the test. And this is what I mean about creating a culture which allows for crazy ideas of saying, we have left brain and right brain people. We should treat them differently. What a concept. And allowing that to be tested and seeing the results and how it can work for your company. So when we're doing pay-per-click, what I hammer on pay-per-click testing is number one, before you even test your pay-per-click ads, you need to make sure that your ad groups are highly segmented and specific to the ads that you're running. You, need, you can test your, your ads, but you've got to make sure that your campaigns are ready to be tested. Make sure before you even start testing your headlines and ad text that it completely lines up with your ad groups. I've seen many people try to test headlines, but they have an ad group of 40 words that could each be their own ad group. And so you've got to bring that down, be more specific. The key in AdWords is being specific and tight in your ad groups and your ad words. And then of course you can go on, test the headline, your ad text, your landing page, and your calls to action. In any area, anything is there, but I usually try the headline and ad text first to get the click through rate going. Once I know the click-through rate's working, then I check that landing page, because that landing page is the call to action. That's what drives people. And so just work through the process on that. The next thing I, I see a lot of value in testing is usability. Usability is, like I said, it's as simple as your mom test. It can be as complex as loading in some software, like Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg will show you where people click on the page. And it's amazing because we've done this for a number of sites, probably a few hundred, and it's, it's always fun to see where people click that isn't really a clickable link. But it looks clickable, and they click on it, which immediately tells you you have a design and usability problem because you have something on the page that looks attractive and looks clickable, and people think they can do it. And when they can't, they get frustrated because now they have to go find it. So Crazy Egg is great from the standpoint of allowing you to see what are people clicking on? What things are they drawn to? Do I have things on my page that don't work or do work? Is it reinforcing what we think? You can also get a scatter map and get a sense of all the places that people are clicking. And we see a few here that that's not a link, sorry. You can click on it, but you're not going anywhere. And so you get a great example of that. And the scatter maps will also allow you to choose based on a number of different factors. So the yellow dots are users who came from this search term. Uh, the orange dots are those that came from a pay-per-click campaign. You can break that out from different areas and see how different people treat the page based on where they came from. So Crazy Egg is just a wonderful tool to allow you to do that. Also, we find it valuable to test forms with Crazy Egg because this was one for a medical center. 
where people would fill out the first name, last name, and the department, but they would never put in a keyword or a condition. And I don't think they understood what that was for. And so, obviously, no one's using it. Let's get rid of it, or let's make it more clear. Because at this point, I think we're just confusing people. And by the way, no one clicked on the advanced button. No one clicked on that. It's too much work. I think people are afraid of what advanced means when they are looking at forms. Uh, Fangui is a really fun kind of software. Has anyone done eye tracking tests? That's because eye tracking costs like 20 grand. All right, a, a good eye tracking test. Fungui, Fangui is a great way of doing a cheap eye tracking test based on eye tracking data. What do I mean by that? This is a software that mimics eye tracking tests based on human behavior attributes from actual eye tracking tests. What does that mean? It's machines trying to act like people. That's all it is. But it's affordable. So what Fungui is doing, this was for a, a pet supply company here, uh, having a, a difficult time and immediately just putting this under the Fungui eye tracking told us that there was a big problem. Because according to the heat map, everyone was looking at the collar, they were looking at the little girl, and then they weren't looking at anything else. And it doesn't take much to figure that out because you've got the logo up in the corner, you've got a 15 word value statement up in the top, uh, and then you've got a pretty girl, and then you've realized that this dog is being shocked because he's barking too much. So immediately, the, the, you know, you're, you're empathizing with this dog. It looks catatonic to start with. But also, and here's one of the telling things, is we block out everything that people aren't seeing. And when we block out everything that the software is telling us that people don't see, well, they don't see everything. What they are seeing is the girl, the collar. Uh, their eyes waver in between the logo and the value statement, and up in the upper left corner, what is that? It's the back button. That is the third most used navigational feature on all websites, which is wrong. So immediately what this tells us is they're not seeing anything. They don't see anything we want them to see. This is the redesign of the PetSafe website. Immediately they changed the value statement from 15 words to four, safe pets, happy owners. That's wonderful. We have a much warmer picture of a, a human and their dog. The dog's not wearing a collar that's shocking them. We have much more products on the page as well as more information. When we do the same test, what we see is people are looking at the dog, they're looking at the products, they're looking at the navigation feature. Let me show it to you this way. Now they're seeing what we want them to see. They are seeing the navigation feature of navigate by animal, small dog, big dog, and cat. They're looking at our try risk free. They're looking at a primary product and also the logo and the dog and the human. So this just gives us a good test of making sure are people seeing what we want them to see. And if so, how can we capitalize on that? If they aren't seeing, how do we react to that? Here's another example of how this works. This is the old American Cancer Society website uh, from a number of years ago. And they ended up changing uh, this page to this page. They redesigned to this. Now, when that went under the gun, it showed a very strange situation. See, here's the rule when it comes to usability. People look at pictures of people all the time. In this design, it was effective because the first thing you will look at is the picture of the woman. I guarantee it, that's the first thing you looked at. But what the beauty of this design is, is she's looking to the right. And so your eyes, naturally on a website, you do a Z pattern. You start at the upper left and go right, down, and right again. That's a natural behavior that everyone has. This accentuates that behavior because you look at her first, which gives you a starting point, and then it goes into the major categories of content on the website, neatly organized in a nice hierarchy. 
the top level is bold and highlighted, and the bottom level comes underneath. The new design puts pictures of people at the bottom. And so when the eye tracking looks at that, well, it shows us that people are looking at pictures of people. And because they're at the bottom of the page, the eyes get taken off that natural Z pattern, and they go to the bottom, and then they rarely do anything else from there. And so what they found is that the click rate on the home page diminished nearly 200% of going through the home page to the rest of the content because they couldn't find it. And if you'll notice, they took the navigation that was in the upper right, they moved it into the left in a blue text on blue box, which is a, essentially a really good way of hiding it because no one ever saw it in the eye tracking. So eye tracking is just a fantastic way of understanding, are people seeing my call to action? Do they see what I want them to see? And, and what eye tracking helps you to understand are the principles of color, contrast, and white space, and the importance they play in navigating people through the content and to the goal, and also how important images can be. Making sure that your images of people, and as I say, people look at pictures of people all the time. Make sure your image accompanies the call to action or accompanies the action that's happening on the page. There have been many tests where there is a picture of someone who's looking off to the left and they're on the left side and it holds the eyes because we want to know what are they looking at. And instead, our eyes get away from that natural Z pattern and end up not going through the site. So eye tracking, click tracking are great ways to help you understand how people are seeing the content on your page and what they're ignoring because they simply can't see it because it's maybe in too little contrast of an area or there's not enough white space or not enough focus on that call to action. From a technical standpoint, this is something that you can take back to keep the geeks happy because here's a test for them. And what the test is, it's a site called GT Metrics. And what GT Metrics will do is it will test the speed of your website. And it will tell you what you can do to increase the speed of your website. And there's all that wonderful geekery of server caching, uh, image dimensions, uh, all these fun things that you can give to your IT crowd so that they can improve the speed of your website. Now, what's interesting is you can also compare uh, your website against three others to see how you are performing on a speed test. And of course, you wanna make sure that your site's loading quickly and easily, and there are multiple things that you can do to improve the speed of your website so that it performs better and acts better as well as helps it perform better with search engines and especially with your users on the site. Ultimately, what this all comes down to is how receptive is your company culture to allowing this type of testing and this type of evaluation in improving your website. Thank you so much for your attention this morning.